Welcome to all of you who are worshiping in Woodside as well as our friends in Minnetonka and those who are tuning in online, glad we can be together. I'm not with you today because I am with Kevin Sharp who is standing next to me. Kevin, many of you recognize because he was part of our team here at Westwood and the Chanhassen campus from 2008 to 2011. And Kevin served as our discipleship pastor during those years. But when we hired him, we knew of his heart and his passion to eventually start a church. We wanted to be part of that. So in 2011, we launched Westbrook Church in Chaska, and Kevin is the senior pastor there, and we're celebrating this week his fifth year anniversary at Westbrook. And I'm speaking there today and yet celebrating with Kevin five great years of ministry, and I want you to hear a little bit about what's been taking place these last five years. Yeah, thanks, Joel. And I just want to say thanks to uh, the Westwood community for all your support and encouragement these last five years. We couldn't have done it with, without that kind of encouragement. And we're excited about what's happening there. We have 15 small groups with over 120 people involved in those groups. And I just, this last spring, I just took a, a tour of each of those groups, and I was so impressed with what I saw happening there. Life's happening, people are ministering to each other, and uh, it's exciting. Exciting. One of the things we tried to do right from the beginning of our church is just to really uh, record who has come to Christ in our church. And this wasn't just a, a check on a box, but we really wanted to see life changing. And in these five years, we've seen 38 people who have really come to faith in Christ. And of those 38 people, 25 of them are, are still in the church serving and thriving. So that's been exciting to see and be a part of. Church planting and the multi-site endeavor that we're part of right now is still the most effective ways to reach people with the love of Jesus Christ. And you're giving testimony to that already through Westbrook. But the dark side of the statistics is that half of the churches that get born close their doors by their fifth birthday. So reaching your fifth birthday is a really big deal. So why is Westbrook working? And why are the doors still open? Well, Joel, we've made plenty of mistakes along the way, but I, I really believe right now we're in a healthy place. We've got a good, solid staff that are skilled. We have a, a committed leadership board, and many people are committed to, to our vision and what we're doing in the church. But obviously, I think the main reason we've been successful is just the gracious hand of God has yeah. been on us, and, and He's uh, led and guided us, and I think also, uh, a main reason why we've been successful is uh, the generosity of you guys at, at Westwood. I just feel like you, hel you helped us recruit 80 people to, to go with us and you supported us financially for three years. And I, I got to tell you, every time I've come and asked for advice or support or encouragement, you guys have been right there to provide that and that's been invaluable. Kevin, it's been a privilege for us to invest into Westbrook and we're excited for you and the future that's before you. And when you think about the future, what do the next five years look like from your perspective? Well, Joel, we're excited about three major areas. The first one is just to continue to be uh, active in the larger community. We wanna be Christ's hands and feet to the people around us. And second, uh, we're actively seeking a, a permanent site, knowing that this is just a tool to uh, reach our, our larger vision, but we really want to be in a permanent site in the next five years. And, and third, uh, we want to continue to see people come to faith in Christ and grow in, in their relationship with Him wherever they may be. Starting a church, Kevin, is filled with all kinds of challenges and learning opportunities. Just out of curiosity, is one thing that you've learned about God in this journey, and then how can we as a church pray for Westbrook? I think one of the things I've learned about God is He's remarkably faithful to His plans and His timetable. And He's not that much concerned about my plans or, or my timetable. So I just ask you to pray for me as a leader, that I have God's wisdom and discernment as I lead the church, and, and pray for our board and, and the church that we'd be faithful to God and faithful to the mission that He's given us. In a moment, Pastor Brian Suter is going to come and teach, but before he does, could we just give thanks to God for his faithfulness and blessing over Westbrook Church? And would you put your hands together in celebration of their fifth birthday, their fifth anniversary? It's a big deal. Might God receive glory, honor, and praise. It's 
it's really meaningful to hear what's going on at Westbrook. There's so many cool things that are happening. And when you uh, remember Westbrook and Kevin, I'd just like to invite you to be in prayer for them. And I'd like to actually start that now. So I'm going to lift them up and I'd love it if you would join me. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for Westbrook Church. You have been faithful to your vision for it, to provide and to change lives and to help people to know you. We're grateful for your presence there that sustains them as a church. And we pray today, even as they gather, that you would continue to move in and through Westbrook. We ask for Kevin, that you would continue to grant him wisdom and discernment as he leads, and that you would give him strength. We pray for the leadership of Westbrook and the church, that they would all be unified, would continue to be faithful to you and to the mission that you have given them. And God, we ask the same thing for us here at Westwood. And so may today, in the words that will come now out of your scriptures and how you use them in our lives, contribute to how that happens. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Again, really good to hear what's going on over at Westbrook. One of the things that captured my attention is how many people in their church are in small groups. And one of the reasons why is because it's a significant um, initiative for us here at Westwood. You've heard about it this fall, and that it's about one one of the best ways that we can grow in friendship and in faith. And all of this, our full driveways video, that whole concept is to encourage you to make this fall season the season that you step toward a small group here if you are not in one yet. And so with that being said, on October 8th here in this Chanhassen campus and then on October 9th at Minnetonka, we're going to be hosting what's called Group Connect, a fun, no-pressure environment for you to be able to meet some new friends and begin together as a small group, and you can take it from there. You can learn more information at the info spot that's at all of our campuses, or go online to register. We'd love to have you with us. There's already a number of people who've registered and some cool small groups with good chemistry that are forming up. Now, if you would take out your teaching notes if you haven't yet and take a couple notes if it would be helpful for you to carry this message out there because we're in the third week of this sermon series that we're calling Paradox. In it, we're focusing on some of the harder sayings of Jesus. Jesus said hard and puzzling words that were often offensive to people and stirred them up in that day and continually so even into our day. These paradoxical teachings that Jesus offers on the surface look contradictory But when we take a moment and engage them more, a deeper meaning of what it means to live in the kingdom of God gets discovered. So it's labor to rest. It's dying to live. And today, it's weak to strong. Now, it's important to listen to what Jesus said and to watch what he did so that we can live more fully, more productively in uh, the kingdom of God as we seek him in the ways that he would have for us. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. We're going to be in a few different places. And so I'm going to do something that I've never done before. I don't know if I'm going to do it again. I'm going to give you the sermon in four sentences. You ready for that? Okay, good. If you exalt yourself, eventually you'll be brought down. If you humble yourself, eventually God will lift you up. Acknowledging your weakness and your imperfection shows that you're humble, and being humble allows you to receive grace from God through Christ, and by depending more on God, we receive his strength for our lives. Amen, and go Vikings. (laughs) We could be done there, and let me just say a word about that last thing. I see a few jerseys in here. I know that we may have a difference of opinion tonight, but that's okay. We're all together this morning. Jesus gives us his paradoxical teaching in Matthew 23, verse 12, when he says, For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This is a proverb or a wisdom saying that shows up multiple different places throughout the Bible. Proverbs 29, 23, Pride brings a person low, but the lowly gain a spirit of honor. 1 Peter 5, 5, All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. So how does this work? How do we become lowly in spirit in order to gain this honor that God promises? As we'll see, it's the work of God through the Holy Spirit in our lives that helps us in our weakness so that he can give us strength. For this verse that Jesus talks about in verse 12, context really matters. Ahead of that, there's 11 verses that set up the scene and help us to understand fully what he meant in that verse that's important for us to explore. In verses 1 through 11, Jesus lays out two different paths that are options for us. One of the paths we should avoid and the other path we should take. 
And the first of the paths is the one to avoid, and that's the path of pride. In it, the Pharisees become the target of Jesus' words here as an object lesson of what not to do. They thought they had everything figured out, but they didn't realize that they were miles away from what God actually wanted from their lives. Throughout the Gospels, actually, they're a common target for Jesus as an object lesson, again, of what not to do. And in Jesus' perspective from Matthew 23, he lays out, through the example of their lives, a five-step process in order uh, to be brought low. So note takers, this is your do not do list. The pride checker. So to exalt yourself and be brought down first, don't practice what you preach. You know, we use this phrase commonly to express a desire that the people that we see live a life of congruity between their actions and the things that they believe and the things that they say, right? But more importantly than that, that's a phrase that we want for ourselves, because we want to be able to live the way that we talk about. Jesus said about the Pharisees in verse 3, they talk a good line, but they don't live it. They don't take into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. It's all spit and polish veneer. It's an important question to ask around how my actions align with the intent of my words and beliefs. Second, to exalt yourself and be brought down, make faith about unbearable religious demands. You know, I think we do this in two different ways. First, we do it to ourselves. We make faith about unbearable religious demands and it has a name. And that name is shame. God doesn't desire that we live in shame. This is not his desire for us. Secondly, we make faith about unbearable religious demands toward other people and there's a name for that as well and the name is judginess. Now, I know that's not a word but I'm gonna use it anyway that it's about judgment. God doesn't desire that we live our lives in judgment and projecting that on other people. He says about the Pharisees, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger. Third, to exalt yourself and be brought down in the kingdom, do it all for show. Life in Jesus, paradoxically enough, is much less about the show that we put on and much more about the humble secret impact that we make through him. He says everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. By the way, we don't have time to explore what that means. But just know that even in the way that they dress, they were trying to make themselves look like a bigger deal than they actually were. Fourth, to exalt yourself and be brought down, take the most important seat. Jesus says about them, they love the place of honor at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogue. This is not the only place that Jesus calls this behavior out throughout the Gospels. In it, he tells his disciples to actually take the seat of lowest honor, which was actual for them at banquets and dinners that they went to, but was also metaphorical in the way that they lived, that they did not put themselves first. Don't take the most important seat. And then fifth, to exalt yourself and be brought down, crave personal recognition and titles. This is so common in our day. Reckless ladder climbing, clamoring for status, self-promotional noise, oftentimes at the expense of other people. You know, there's just something in our human fabric that left unchecked will cause us to want to pursue this at our demise. And about the Pharisees, Jesus said in verse seven, they love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. So this is the path of pride. And in the kingdom, if we exalt ourselves, eventually we will be brought down Now again, this is the do not do list. And the Pharisees were the object lesson of what not to do. But this week as I read one of the commentaries that I did, it said, at any given point in every one of our lives, there exists a Pharisee within us that we're aware of or we're not aware of. And that's an important moment of humility. So as you look at that list, where might you be receiving a little bit of a gut check this morning, perhaps as you've wandered down the path of pride? Jesus lays out a different path, what we can do about this path of pride and going down a better path and that's the path of humility. So according to Jesus in Matthew 23, there's three steps to this path, three ways, and the first of which is to just let go of the title. We don't need it. In verse eight, Jesus says, but you do not let anyone call you rabbi, that is teacher, for you are all brothers and you have only one teacher, the anointed one. 
The Pharisees chase spiritual titles, and for us, that takes the shape and form of a few other pursuits in our world. But what we have to remember is to make our lives, our words, and our action about Jesus, not about any pursuit of titles or statuses or achievements that would make us to be want, want to be a bigger deal than we ought to be. Because at the end of the day, titles, status, they come and they go, don't they? They come and they go. And we can let go of our desire for titles because we already have the most important title that a human being can take on. And that's that we're the beloved. Brennan Menning says, living in awareness of our belovedness in Christ is the axis around which the entire Christian life revolves. It's not merely a lofty thought or an inspiring idea. And it's not just one name among many. It is the name by which God knows us in the way that he relates to us. And by the way, that's a title that will never leave you. That's safe and secure throughout all of eternity. We don't need any other title. Second on the path of humility is to similar to that, to take hold of belonging. Jesus says in Matthew 23, verse 9, and don't call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Quick side note, this doesn't mean that all of a sudden you go on a first name basis with your dad. That happens to me with our kids every once in a while. I'll come downstairs and they'll say, hi, Brian. And I'm, what are we, in a professional relationship now? Are you going to submit your report today? What Jesus' point is this, is that you belong to a loving father who will never let you go. And the difference that that makes is that every one of us can wake up and remember that no matter what happens in any given day, God loves me no matter what, end of sentence. And that transcends anything good or bad that comes our ways. So if we have success, we can thank God and not get too self-focused. If we have failure or if we encounter challenges or difficulties or disappointments, no matter what, that does not go away. If we experience acceptance, we can be grateful for some, how someone emulated Christ's acceptance for us. And we've, if we experience rejection, we can remember that that hurts, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day because I am received and accepted by Jesus Christ alone. It's tangible. We don't need to be prideful when we remember first that we belong to him alone. And nothing else as good as that. And then the result of that is the third part of this path, and that's to serve. When we let go of our titles and we take hold of belonging, we can serve no matter what our other titles are. Jesus says this, the greatest among you will be your servant. That sums it up, and there's really good results from humility. If you exalt, exalt yourself, in the kingdom, eventually you will be brought down. But if you humble yourself, eventually God will lift you up. As I walk through those two different paths, I find myself wanting to live on the humble path. How about you? But yet, if I'm being candid, it's way easier to get up here on this platform and talk about it than to go out those doors and live in it. How about you? because we daily battled this raging uh, battle between pride and humility. There's a gap that exists between our intentions and our actions. I can see that gap sometimes, but other people in my life see that gap way better than I do. And we need grace. We need grace from God and we need grace from each other. We're not enough on our own and we can't do, earn, elevate, or fake ourselves to freedom. Only Jesus is enough. Now, the Pharisees were Jesus' target of what not to do, but there was one Pharisee who figured it out. You could call him a recovering Pharisee, perhaps. You might know where I'm heading, but this is the Apostle Paul who was once known as Saul, a Pharisee of the highest order who found his way in Jesus to move away from the path of pride onto the path of humility where he found that in his very weakest parts, his strength was enough. Let's explore that. He wrote staggering words in 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 10. They're in your program if you'd like to follow along with me. Therefore, in order to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power 
my rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul traveled this interesting journey to get there. He traveled from weakness, and his weakness informed his humility, and in his humility, he was able to receive grace from Jesus Christ and become strong in the weakest parts of where he was. And we see some things in this scripture passage that he lays out that are invitations for us, and the first of those is to prayerfully embrace our weaknesses. We don't like weakness. What's the most common answer to the question in a job interview? What are your most significant weaknesses? Well, I tend to take on too much work. You know, I'm really a perfectionist. And there's self-protection in that. What if we answered those questions honestly? Well, I can be really harsh when I get interrupted by people. I'm really notoriously late in the morning. You know, I actually only work for about 60% of the day. And when it comes to follow through, I'm at about a three to five ratio. We don't do that because what would the answer be? Well, here's the door. Have a nice life. We're slow to acknowledge our weakness. We self-protect. We don't like vulnerability. And we certainly don't like weakness. You ever heard the statement, pain is weakness leaving the body? That's really helpful if you're working out. But it's indicative of the fact that as human beings, we don't like weakness. But here's the thing in the kingdom that gets paradoxical. Where your greatest weakness lies is the greatest opportunity and potential for you to live fully alive in the kingdom if you are willing and able to meet Jesus in it. Because that is where his strength gets perfected. Paul writes about that. In order for me to keep from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh. Now, it's important to know that for hundreds of years, really smart people have speculated about what that thorn was. And no one's come up with a good answer because it doesn't matter. What matters is Paul had an incredible humiliation that brought him to the feet of Jesus. And he said, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And his deepest humiliation became his greatest opportunity to know more of God's presence and strength and grace in his life. So for you, where is your greatest weakness? Where is your greatest struggle? Where is your biggest gap between the intentions of where you want to live and where you actually live in your everyday life? If you exalt yourself in the kingdom, eventually you'll be brought down. If you humble yourself, eventually God will lift you up. And acknowledging your weakness and embracing your imperfection shows that you're humble so that you can next receive grace. These beautiful words, Paul writes, but he, Jesus said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. This is the most important part of this little section of scripture. And many scholars think that this is the most important statement that Paul wrote in the entirety of the book of 2 Corinthians. It became about Jesus and not Paul, and that was his secret. And every follower of Jesus must know deep within our bones that human weakness and limitation and divine grace go hand in hand every single day in order for God to do something amazing in it. James 4, 6 says, but he gives us more grace. That is why the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. If you exalt yourself in the kingdom, eventually you'll be brought down. But if you humble yourself, eventually God will lift you up. Acknowledging your weakness and embracing your limitation. And imperfection shows that you're humble. And being humble allows you to receive grace from God through Jesus Christ so that you can last celebrate your weakness. Wait, what? Yeah, celebrate your weakness. That's what it says here. Paul writes, so now I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and in difficulties, that Christ's power may rest on me, for when I am weak, then I am strong. You know, as I go through this, 
there's just a real deep desire in my being that I want to live this way. And I hope that there is for you too. But sometimes in order to do so, it can be hard to know how this actually happens. So how does weakness become strength in the kingdom? This is not just something that we can talk about. This is something that we need to go out and live. And in order to do so, we need examples of how to do this. And this week I got to thinking about a person. You may know who she is. Her name is Johnny Erickson Tata. Johnny's the founder and CEO of Johnny and Friends International Disability Center and is an international advocate for people with disabilities. In 1967, at 17 years old, she was paralyzed from the shoulders down as a result of a swimming accident. And in the early days that followed her injury, they were marked by depression and a dark cloud. And she said these words, I was so sick and tired of despair and feelings of self-pity. I cried out to God and said, God, if I can't die, then show me how to live. And she said the next day she woke up a different person. She learned how to paint with a brush, with her teeth, has since authored more than 50 books and recorded many albums herself. 2010 was another twist for her in her journey when she was diagnosed with stage three cancer. She and her organization have given life to people around the world with disabilities and she lives this and shows the world how Christ's power is made perfect in her weakness. She says, every day I wake up and dread another day of being a quadriplegic. Isn't that honest? I asked Jesus to help me and keep me going, and he's never let me down. She continues on to say, some people tend to believe that I'm a strong believer, a strong Christian, but I'm here to tell you that's not true. I'm not a strong believer. I'm very weak. Because if we deny our weakness, we'll never realize God's strength in us. My weakness is my quadriplegia, but it's my greatest asset because it forces me into the arms of Christ every single morning when I get up. Please know I'm no expert at this wheelchair thing. I'm no professional at being quadriplegic. There are so many mornings when I wake up and hear my friend come to the front door to help me get out of bed and get me ready for the day. She goes into the kitchen, turns on the water, and starts brewing coffee. And I know in a few minutes she's going to come gliding into the bedroom where she will greet me with a good morning and I am lying there with my eyes closed thinking, oh God, I cannot do this again. I'm so tired. I don't know how I'm going to make it to lunchtime. I cannot do this thing called quadriplegia. I have no resources for this. I have no strength for this. But you do. You've got resources. You've got strength. I can't do quadriplegia, but I can do all things through you as you strengthen me. I have no smile for this woman who's going to walk through my bedroom in a moment. And just as he promises, he hears the cries of the afflicted. And before even 7.30 in the morning, he has sent joy straight from heaven. Then when my friend comes in the door with a steaming cup of coffee, I can greet her with a happy hello borrowed from God. So then... Join me. Boast in your afflictions. Delight in your infirmities. Glory in your weakness because you will know then that Christ's power rests on you. Those are her words. She's an incredible example for all of us. Every single one of our weaknesses are different. God knows about them. He's with us in them. And when we are ready to prayerfully embrace them, he will pour out from heaven more resources than we know possible. If we exalt ourselves in the kingdom, eventually we will be brought down. But if we humble ourselves, eventually God will lift us up. Acknowledging our weaknesses and embracing our imperfections shows that we are humble, and being humble allows us to receive grace from God through Jesus Christ. And by depending more on God, we receive his strength for our everyday life. That's really good news. And my prayerful intention is that for you, no matter if you need it in this moment or not, that you will hear God's voice say, I want to provide that for you today. And we need his help. So what I'd like to ask that you do is you stand with me and you join me in prayer to ask him for that help in our weakness. Lord God, we come before you confessing that all of us carry weaknesses. They come about in our lives in many different ways. You know about them and we're so grateful, God, that we have a God that is with us, that is not somewhere else that we need to pray to to come to where we are. You're already here. 
And God, we thank you for your promises, many promises, but particularly we thank you that the promise you make to us that your power is made perfect where we are weak is true for us today. And so God, in the way that only you can, invade our hearts and our worlds and help us to know where you want to make your strength perfect. Ever so more, every day, in our actual lives, right as we live them. God, we need you, and we confess that. Would you make your strength perfect in our weakness today? In Jesus' name.